but cells are not the only uh, you know structure that have membranes, uh, phospholipid membranes. So mitochondrial membranes, both EPA and DHA yeah. accumulate in mitochondrial membranes. You alluded to mitochondria earlier. Um, is there a possibility that omega-3 modulates mitochondria in human skeletal muscle? Yeah, there is. And, and you know, the mitochondria is something that I've just started to really get into um, in terms of in my lab and setup. I, I learned, you know, some of the techniques from Graham Holloway when I was at Guelph as a postdoc. And that's like an arm that I'm trying to develop in my lab now to address some of these questions. And I do think that's probably the most exciting area um, for me right now with omega-3s and, and how it links to the regulation of protein synthesis. So for example, Graham had shown um, a number of years ago that feeding omega-3s um, in, in younger people can affect a, uh, you know, ADP sensitivity, um, or ADP stimulated respiration, uh, in the mitochondria in, in human skeletal muscle. And then in our disuse atrophy study, again, it seemed to affect ADP respiration, but then, you know, that's a, that's nice in terms of a concept, but so what, how does that then feed into skeletal muscle? Well, there's now emerging evidence, uh, sorry, into protein synthesis. Now, there is emerging evidence that there seems to be some kind of mitochondrial systolic crosstalk whereby, you know, if you think about the mitochondria, the primary site of, you know, where we produce energy and muscle protein synthesis is a very energetically expensive process. So if the mitochondria are not working properly, then there may not be the energy to, you know, mount a protein synthetic response and, you know, vice versa. Um, another caveat with the mitochondrial analyses is it depends upon time, you know, what substrates you're using to stimulate respiration, you know, if you if you're using a carbohydrate or a fat based substrate, but nevertheless, is um, what we're trying to investigate now is whether you know there there is this crosstalk between the the the, the, the translation or the initiation and translation factors that regulate protein synthesis, and you know mitochondrial protein synthesis and mitochondrial respiration. And there's been some papers in in worms and in preclinical models showing that you know mitochondrial translation or the translation of mitochondrial proteins. Um, in and of itself will feed in as a signal to whether we, uh, w to the systolic factors that regulate protein synthesis in an ATF4 dependent fashion. So again, this is preclinical, it's very early, but what we're studying here is is whether that occurs um, in humans. We've got a studies in surgery in the hospital going on now with omega-3s um, and we're doing the biopsies and, we're, and we've got the respiration measures and we're going to try and tease that out. So I do think the mitochondria are a very, very interesting area of research when it comes to omega-3s and, 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 and protein turnover. And it's something that we're really looking to, to explore a little bit more. But exactly what that link is, um, I'm not too sure at this stage. Well, that's very exciting. I think um, I, I would be interested also just seeing what not necessarily in skeletal muscle, but like, you know, looking at the broader, broader scientific literature, like what's known about how omega-3, DHA, EPA um, affect the mitochondrial function, mitochondrial structure, yeah. their dynamics, um, all those things would be, you know, obviously interesting to, to kind of be able to see, well, if that's going on other tissues, perhaps something similar also in skeletal muscle. And so that, that's all, um, that's really exciting. Uh, I, so there's, I, there's a few studies like limited, I'd say limited evidence showing that DHA and EPA can increase the metabolic rate of both, um, resting and during exercise in older women. Yeah. And these effects yeah. are, were even more profound in like fat oxidation. So it was like a 19% increase in, in resting metabolic rate and 27% increase in, uh, during yeah. exercise for fat oxidation. Do you think this could be attributed to a mitochondrial related mechanism? Yeah, potentially incorporation into the into the inner and outer chondral, you know, membranes of the mitochondria could potentially alter, you know, ADP handling and, and and oxygen utilization. And again, this is not exactly my particular area of expertise, but I've seen some work of like, you know, um, from Australia where they've shown like, you know, feeding omega threes can I think it was particularly DHA can reduce the oxygen cost of exercise and reduce heart rate. Again, this is this is something, you know, where you, you kind of read one piece of literature. It, that is slightly related, but not related. And you try to use it to feed in, to generate these hypotheses with, you know, how it affects muscle mass regulation as well as the mitochondria. But um, from my understanding is that I really wouldn't know how that actually works in terms of, you, you know, changes in substrate oxidation uh, with omega-3s. One kind of natural thought is when you're giving people high doses of omega-3s, five grams per day, which is a lot more than typically what we would consume, maybe it switches the, you know, the substrates that are being oxidized, or it may induce a very small shift towards 
um, uh, the oxidation of fatty acids as opposed to carbohydrates. And there is a little bit of evidence that, you know, that might not, in the context of, you know, glucose homeostasis, that might not necessarily be a great thing because if you're, if you're shifting from, you know, oxidizing glucose, um, to fats, then in diabetic patients or people with high levels of, of, of circulating glucose, it may actually even bump those levels. So kind of going back to what we talked about before, um, in terms of substrate utilization with these feeding protocols. But I wonder if just the sheer effects on increasing GLUT3 transporters in skeletal muscle would, uh, you'd at least be getting the glucose transport into muscle and out of circulation, if that would just in and of itself be, uh, somewhat beneficial. Um, yeah. As, yeah. As and well. I would, I would, yeah, I, and I'm not aware of any evidence that, you know, there is increase in GLUT4 transporters with um, in skeletal muscle with omega-3s, and uh, maybe there is, I, I'm just not aware of it. And sometimes I think with the transporters, it makes me think about the, the LAT1 work is you may have more of protein content, but is that protein content functional? You know, is is it actually more effective and more efficient? You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, you mentioned something about the the dose as well, and I think it kind of, to go back to the importance of protocols, you know, how, how long does it take omega threes to accumulate in mitochondrial membrane? So you mentioned four weeks, you know, for you know the the change in the the skeletal muscle like yeah. lipid membranes. But like, what if it's something similar for the mitochondrial membranes and you know the dose as well? You also mentioned sort of food yeah. food first approach and you know eating fatty fish, of course, salmon and ma sardines, mackerel being sort of yeah. the best sources of omega three. Um, but you're not going to get, you know, four to five grams a day. It, and first of all, people aren't going to eat fatty fish every day. Like they're just not like, it's not, they don't, they don't even eat it weekly. Like it's, that's, that's like, yeah. we have, we have NHANE study on studies on that. They're not, they're not eating fish a lot of, a lot of, especially in yeah. America, um, in the United States. Yeah. But, um, you know, so the, the question is, is like the 45 or even perhaps what if it's even higher dose? Like what if we don't even like, there's not there's been no dose response studies, right? To, to even know. No. So do you, like how no. feasible, obviously it's good to get omega-3 from food sources, like for many reasons. But if we're looking at the accumulation, like, you know, some of these effects in the mitochondrial membranes, in this, you know, the cell membranes and skeletal muscle, how feasible do you think it is to only get it from food? Um, it, it, again, it just, so I think this is, the, it kind of leads me to a slightly separate kind of answer, if you don't mind, is, you know, the, the, the omega-3 index, which has been established in blood and is related to the CVD risks, um, we haven't really got something similar in skeletal muscle. So we don't know what is the level of omega-3s or EPA and DHA, and there's even now evidence that the two may have opposing effects, but what, are, what, what is the amount or relative contribution or composition in the muscle membrane that is then linked to a clinically meaningful cutoff or outcome. And I think that's kind of something that, you know, will take a long time for us to establish. And this is where it comes to getting it into the clinics is, is case of like, well, how much do I need to take? What is the clinical cutoff in terms of the muscle or the blood? Um, and how is that going to help the patient? And I think the, you know, thinking back of, well, it, it would the answer is it would depend upon what is the level in the muscle that we need to get to to see these effects so then we can work back through a dose response so you might be able to take a large amount in a five-day period and then just top it off with like one gram a day so do you take five grams a day and then just top it off with one gram a day and it stays in that range um i know stuart galloway is doing looking at some work like that at the moment um or is it a case if you just take one a day or two a day and you just do that all year round and then you're going to see a level of change in, in the muscle phospholipid membrane. Um, I just don't know the answer to that question. And I think the next steps for us to really start convincing people of, you know, omega-3s are important is to link the mechanism firstly, and then what is the change in the, in, in the composition of the membrane and how does that relate to important clinical outcomes?